so the topic of my presentation is genetic considerations for tree farms in a changing climate. So, and I'm going to take a broad definition of genetics. So I'm going to include species in there too, mm -hmm. as well as uh, within uh, species variation, genetics within species variation. And the main message I want to give to you is that trees are adapted to the climate. And they're adapted to the climate in which they've evolved, that is, the local climate. But that local climate is changing. So as it changes, they're going to become more le less and less adapted or more, or more maladapted. But there's things we can do about that. And I'm going to uh, talk about some of those things. And I'm going to, uh, a major part of the presentation is to present to you two uh, web-based tools that we have developed to look at uh, the suitability of species and the suitability of seed sources to current and future climates. So again, the main premise of my talk is that plants are adapted to local climates. So every species, every population, every individual plant has a range of climates in which it can best survive, grow, and reproduce. And because of natural selection at a location, we can assume that plants are adapted to their local climate. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with this concept. It's why we have uh, forest tree seed zones. And as Dave mentioned, we have these, uh, many of you are probably gardeners, so you know about USDA plant hardiness zones or the Sunset Gardening Guides. It's all based on climate and specifically uh, cold temperatures. But Climates are changing, which affects adaptation. So, populations are. Is there a pointer to this? Oh, there it is. So, populations are adapted to some historic climate. But as the climate changes, they become mismatched to that future climate. <clears throat> so, by mid century, all right, so right now we've seen about 0.7 to about 1 degree Celsius. And I apologize about using Celsius, but mo all my slides are in Celsius. Uh, it, a change in the climate so far to date in the Pacific Northwest. But by mid-century, we can expect warming closer to 2 to 3 degrees. Thus, in many places, we're going to start seeing reductions in productivity and increased mortality. So this is an example after... Uh, many years of drought in the Sierra Nevada in the uh, last decade and increased mortality there. <clears throat> and in many places, the change is going to be big enough that it, that it moves beyond the climatic niche of the species. So what can we do about it? Well, one of the most important decisions that you can make as a forest manager is uh, how to reforest your man your land so the first question the first question that you face is should you use natural regeneration or planting and so to answer that question we ask the question can I get sufficient stocking of a desired species in a reasonable time frame uh, and if you can't then you should plant the other question is well can I improve productivity using uh, select planting stock from a tree improvement program and again if you want to try to do that, you're probably going to, you're going to need to plant. But the question that I would address is, will those trees be adapted? So as I said, local species and seed sources have been the default choice. But perhaps we should consider other seed sources and other species. And if that's the case, planting will become more important in the future because of climate change. So then your next two questions are, what's your choice of species and what's the choice of seed source? Uh, so to address that, you got to ask, well, what species and seed sources are available? Uh, is there, for example, uh, Willamette Valley Ponderosa pine available? But then again, the question I'm going to address is, uh, what, tree, what will those trees be adapted at the species or seed source level? So I'm going to talk about this in, in two parts. First, I'm going to talk about species considerations, and then I'll talk about seed source considerations. <clears throat> so most often, when you're, re when you're uh, looking at choice of species, you're going to choose the species that's always been there. 
uh, that which is present at the site. But if we're considering other species, particularly with a changed climate, one of the ways that we decide on the suitability of a species uh, for a planting site is to uh, use something called environmental niche modeling. Uh, so this is modeling to predict the distribution of a species in geographic space based on their known distribution in environmental space. That is their realized ecological niche. Uh, it's basically a correlative process. So you're looking at the relationship between climate or other environmental variables and whether it, the uh, species is present or absent at that location. So this is also called climatic niche modeling, species distribution modeling, predicted habitat distribution modeling, or climate envelope modeling. The, most often, we're looking at climate with respect to uh, niche modeling. Um, the, uh, so, for example, here is, uh, this is from a paper by Jerry Rayfeld, who uh, is a retired uh, forest geneticist from the Rocky Mountain Research Station of the Forest Service. Uh, he produced a series of three papers. I was minorly involved in some of these papers. Uh, and this is the first of those papers that looked at species uh, niche modeling. So this is the uh, niche model for Douglas fir. Uh, and so it shows the distribution of Douglas fir. And it's, it's pretty accurate. Uh, the error rates, is, it says if it predicts that it's present, uh, but it's absent, is 5.4%. And there's many reasons why yeah, you may predict that it's supposed to be there, but it's not. But more importantly, this predict that it's absent, but it's present, has an error rate of only 0.5%. It does a pretty good job. Um, but the criticism is that it does not always reflect the actual species distribution, for example, there. Uh, and the actual distribution may depend on a number of other factors, including dispersal ability. Was there uh, species nearby so it could uh, move into there? Uh, evolutionary history, uh, and in particular, biotic interactions. Perhaps it's not there because it gets outcompeted by other species. Um, so, so these are all valid criticisms, but it doesn't invalidate the value of considering if the climate is right for the possibility that the species may exist at a location. And also, with some of these factors may be less important if you're managing the forest and not relying just on natural processes. For example, we can get around dispersal ability by planting. Uh, we can get around some of the biotic interactions by thinning. So you can favor species that, that may be of interest. So this will show you where the climate may be suitable for that species. An important value of climatic niche modeling is that we can project what might happen to the potential habitat in the future given climate change. Uh, so this is the predicted climatic niches uh, by 2060 for Douglas fir varieties. So the brown is the coastal variety, Menziesii, and the green is the uh, Rocky Mountain variety, Glauca. Uh, and what it shows, the dark color is habitat loss. Uh, the middle color uh, shade is a habitat that is there now and remains in the, in the future. And the light color is habitat gain. So what it shows, for example, is that the habitat loss is generally at the trailing edge of climate change, that is, at lower elevations and further south. Uh, and habitat gained is at the leading edge, at higher elevations and further north. For the variety, the coastal variety, it says that 82% of the current range of the species will remain suitable f uh, in the future. 18% uh, at the lower elevations and further south, for example, in, in California or uh, further south in the Rocky Mountain variety, will disappear, but it will gain 18% at higher elevations and further north. Particularly with the, uh, with the Rocky Mountain variety, the situation is a little more drastic. Only 65% of the habitat remains suitable, whereas 35% of the habitat is lost. Uh, particularly, again, at the uh, further south, lower elevations. But one of the main points I want to make to you is that you can't just consider the species niche. You also have to consider that there's population variation within species. 
And that's uh, part of the third paper from uh, Jerry Rayfeld, where he looks at this population variation. So these figures so show Kleins or, or genetic variation in growth potential with current and future climatic niches. So here's the range of the species uh, currently, and the different colors show different, uh, basically, types or genetic variation within this species uh, that now and in the future. So what we find is that of the 82% of the habitat that is suitable today and in the future, uh, for the Rocky Mountain variety, 58% uh, only 58% of it will be suitable through 2060. With the uh, the Rocky Mountain variety of the 68% that's suitable today and into the future, only 1% of it will be suitable in the future because of uh, the because of maladaptation of those local populations. Yes. One percent. This is the uh, sixty-eight percent of the range of the species that remains suitable, but only one percent of it is suitable if you consider whether the the local population is suitable or not. So that's a big that's a big difference. So the, this uh, the purpose of this is to illustrate my point that you need to consider genetic variation. Um, and, and I'll go into that more in, in, a, in a little bit when I talk about seed source considerations. But first, what I want to do... Oh, it looks like I skipped a slide. Um, so what I want to do now is uh, talk about a tool that we've uh, developed called the Species Potential Habitat Tool. Uh, and what this tool does is it's designed to help forest managers identify species uh, or vegetation types, not in this case, but it could, that are suitable for specific sites given climate change projections, allowing the transition of forests to species compositions that may be better suited to future climates. So, um, so what we did So uh, what this tool does is you can zoom into areas of interest. So what, what we did is that it's integrated with the uh, tool that I'm going to talk about in a little bit, the seedlot selection tool. So the seedlot selection tool will show you what seed sources are compatible. But this can address that first question is, is it within the species niche? Uh, uh, and what's nice about it is because it's uh, integrated with the seedlot selection tool, you can zoom into areas of interest to look specifically at your site to see whether it's um, uh, what species are suitable or not. You can look at the same time periods and RCPs as those in the seedlot selection tool. Uh, and then you can export this as a GIS file and you can even use it as a constraint in the seedlot selection tool that I'll talk about. Now this uses uh, the species niche models that were developed by Tong Lee Wang at the University of British Columbia. And there may be other niche models out there uh, that you can look at, but they, are, they don't really differ that much from each other, at least at a, at a large scale. At the fine scale, for that example, the Willamette Valley Ponderosa Pine, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so what I want to do right now is go through the species potential habitat tool and just show you how it works and uh, so that you may be able to use it yourself. So the first step is to select a species. Now at this time, there's only five species in the tool and we hope to integrate more into the tool as we work with Tong Lee with it. Of course, some of this depends on funding, but <coughs> we'll see. Uh, the five species are lodgepole pine, Douglas fir, I can't read this, uh, Sitka spruce, ponderosa pine, and Engelmann spruce. So really there's two, maybe three species of interest in this area that are in the tool right now. So we're going to uh, select Douglas fir, and then you select a distribution record. So we're going to select uh, an a historic climate, basically 1961 to 1990, 
again, in all these things, we use a ba uh, basically a 30-year period because climate is or weather is variable. So we use climate, and it's typically done on a 30-year period. This kind of represents a time period that is basically before there was a, l a large amount of climate change. Uh, so I, it represents what and what things were historically adapted to. So you do that and you come up with this uh, historic distribution <coughs> of Douglas fir. Uh, so this is what it looks like, you know, and, and, and it looks pretty accurate. Of course, it's maybe missing some things like in the Willamette Valley where it grows, but it really hasn't grown there historically in the past. But uh, the next step is to uh, select a modeling condition, that is a future time period and an RCP or emission scenario that you might expect in the future. And you can look at different futures. That's one of the advantages of this as opposed to just going to a, a publication is that you can play around with it to, to see what happens if you uh, make different assumptions about it uh, and different par uh, points into the future. So we're going to uh, select uh, an RCP of 4.5. Uh, and the uh, next 30-year uh, period, uh, we're already into it, but uh, this will all be changed maybe in a couple of years when we get to the 20, uh, past 2020. Um, so this is what the distribution looks like for Douglas fir uh, with the 2011 to 2040 time period. So in the next few decades, an RCP of 8.5. Uh, the yellow represents habitat loss. And the green and the blue represents habitat gained. So again, you see habitat gained at the higher elevations and habitat loss at the lower elevations. And interestingly enough, around the Puget Sound. And I'm not quite sure why that is, but it could be because uh, with the increased temperatures, uh, it's a little bit of rain shadow and it gets drier. Uh, then if we look at the next time period, 2041 to 2070, so about mid-century, uh, we see uh, more habitat lost at the lower elevations and more habitat gained at the higher elevations and further north. And if we look at towards the end of the century, we see again, more habitat loss uh, at lower elevations and more gained at the higher elevations and further north. So you can, uh, just to go through that again, quickly, here's the historic distribution, the next few decades, mid-century, and by the end of the century, this is what it uh, projected to look like for the distribution, the suitability of Douglas fir uh, across the range of the species. Uh, the other thing we can do is we can look at test assumptions by looking at uh, clicking multiple of these scenarios. So we can look at the 4.5 uh, and the 8.5 RCPs and uh, where you got two, it shows whether it, the scenarios agree or uh, whether there's one uh, scenario or two of the scenarios agree or not. RCP is the uh, representative concentration pathway. So it's basically the projection for emissions in the future. Uh, so, and what the number means, I don't, I don't quite remember the exact number, what the 4.5 means, but basically. Watts per meter squared. Okay, there you go. W watts per meter square. That was that rate of four things. Chris's way. Yeah, there you go. The trajectory, right. Now, what I've done in the seed lot selection tool, and I'll show you this, is I've played, a, I've played around with it a lot, and it shows you the last 30-year period, and then the next future, uh, future the next 30-year uh, period, and what it tells you is that we've basically already warmed up to the uh, 4.5 level of the next 30-year period. So as a result of that, I've sort of you know, we're already on that trajectory of 8.5. So I'm just going to show you the 8.5, uh, just to not show you too many slides. Yes? In British Columbia, 
Uh, yes, it, 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 it implies that, not that it will replace the uh, lodgepole pine, but that the habitat is suitable for it. So if they, you know, uh, if there's uh, the historic climate, uh, if the historic climate, uh, you know, rest, uh, distribution of the species is here, uh, you're not going to get Douglas fir up here uh, because there's no seed sources, but you could plant it there and it should be suitable. And this is also, again, this is a climatic niche, so it's also ignoring uh, biotic interactions too. So you, with, certainly with management, you can, you can make it more suitable. Uh, so just to look at uh, ponderosa pine, and uh, I kind of alluded to this earlier, uh, this is the distribution by the end of the century, and uh, the green and yellow show where the habitat was and or has been lost and the blue shows uh, where it'll become more suitable the climate will become more suitable as you can see it's expanding north in Oregon and north in British Columbia and Alberta and uh, to higher elevations uh, but we're losing it to the lower elevations now as I mentioned uh, this is based on the uh, relationship um, across the whole range of species. I doubt they had uh, Willamette Valley Ponderosa Pine in there. It might have changed the distribution a little bit, but this also shows the importance of looking at genetic variation in addition to the species niche. Because uh, as you can see, it does not show that it's suitable here, but maybe it would be if you were using Ponderosa Pine from Willamette Valley or Fort Lewis. <coughs> so uh, now I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, seed source considerations. And uh, so I'll use some terms interchangeably here. Yes? Before we leave the last yeah. one, am I able to drill in to my fiber? Yes, uh, you can. But again, this, the, you got to keep in mind, at, at least at the species level, it may not be that accurate. But it's not far off. As I showed with uh, another niche model, uh, the error rate of it being predicted to being there and, but uh, is absent is only 0.5%. Uh, so, and, and then the other thing is you got also, this is a climatic niche model. So you got to also consider suitability of soils, biotic interactions, that sort of thing. But uh, you already do that. Uh, you, you are familiar with some of those things of whether or not a species is going to be suitable there and how to manage that species. Um, certainly, as we were saying, those uh, glacial outwash soils will probably uh, be good for ponderosa pine as long as you're using the correct seed source, you try to move it from uh, the east side over to here, you're going to get trouble with uh, needle diseases. Uh, okay, seed source consideration. So there's some, I use the term seed source, but there's other terms that also are used. Uh, I may interchangeably use the term uh, populations or provenances or seed lots. And we call this tool that I'm going to talk about the seed lot selection tool. And the reason for uh, seed lots are generally the same thing, but maybe a little bit broader because they may include uh, uh, planting material that's not associated to a specific, specific geographic location. Um, so in general, I think you'll probably favor a species that is local to a planting site, at least uh, for the next few decades. Uh, unless you're at the warming edge of the species range and you're going to have to change species or uh, and you're, because you're going to start to see examples, uh, start to see problems. Uh, an example of that from anecdotal evidence that I've heard in Idaho for, uh, is that to the lower elevations after fires, they've gone back in, there's ponderosa pine there. They've tried to plant ponderosa pine, they, continue, they keep going back and planting ponderosa pine, it keeps dying. Basically, that ecosystem has changed from forest to to a grassland uh, because of pro because of climate change, probably. <coughs>
But as I indicated earlier, uh, okay, so first let's look at, uh, um, so first I wanted to, I wanted to make five points. Um, the first point, again, and I, and I think I made this point already, that there's genetic variation across the landscape, but also that this variation tracks climatic gra gradients. Uh, and, and this can be taken as evidence for adaptation. So the way we look at genetic variation is we use something very simple called common garden study, where you put everything in the same environment and the differences you see uh, because the environment is, same, is the same is predominantly due to genetics and not, and not to environmental differences. Uh, a type of common garden study is the Douglas fir gene ecology study. Uh, gene ecology is the study of interspecific variation in plants in relation to the environment of the seed source. Uh, so basically when you have consistent correlations between where a plant came and the variation you see when it's in a common garden, that's taken as evidence for adaptation. So for example, this is a study I did uh, quite a while ago now. Uh, collected seed from many Douglas fir trees from throughout Western Oregon and Washington. I grew those families in a short-term study, relatively short-term, still took a few years, uh, in, in a common environment in nursery beds out back in Corvallis, Oregon. I measured them for many adaptive traits, for example, bud burst. You can see differences in bud burst between these two families from different places. Uh, look at the relationship between uh, climate, climate and uh, uh, different uh, traits. So this is a trait that basically measures vigor. So it's a, it's a combination of uh, variables that measure uh, gro growth, um, root shoot ratio, uh, uh, see, uh, bud set, sorry. Uh, and we can see that there's this relationship between uh, how quickly uh, the seedlings grow and December minimum temperature. And then the nice thing is uh, we can take uh, GIS and we can map that relationship so that you can see the very, you can map that variation across the landscape. So this is from that study. Uh, basically the point is that uh, we have populations that differ. This QST is a measure of how different the populations are. Uh, the traits are correlated with the source environments. This, this correlation is uh, right here. So that's a fairly strong correlation of about 0.8. Uh, and these relationships make sense. So for example, we uh, looked at cold damage by uh, taking twigs from these seedlings and uh, freezing them and seeing how much damage there was. And there's a very strong relationship. Uh, there's a lot of population variation and a strong relationship between whether it was damaged, for example, those from Southern Oregon along the coast were highly damaged. Those from the higher elevation, as you ex would, might expect, were not so damaged. So that relationship makes sense. This is taken as evidence for adaptation. Uh, as always, uh, cold damage, bud set, biomass, they all kind of have the same pattern, uh, but the uh, different traits could show different patterns and scales of adaptation. So bud burst kind of has a different pattern uh, of variation that's more related to aridity or, or precip. So that those in southern Oregon uh, burst bud more quickly than those in uh, Washington, the Olympic, uh, or the Olympic Peninsula. And the reasoning behind that is because parents that burst bud early uh, got out growing before drought commenced in the summer were those that survived and reproduced and and, uh, and produced the seedlings that we put into the common garden study that then show that same trait, the, that trait that was uh, inherited. Uh, so uh, this is just another quick example uh, from University of British Columbia, Sally Aiken, looking at Sitka spruce planted in Vancouver and variation in uh, growth potential from uh, California to Alaska related to temperature. But that tells us something about what climate variables may be driving adaptation. 
but it doesn't really tell us uh, what one of the assumptions of gene ecology is that local populations are best if you use that information to uh, make seed transfer uh, guidelines but uh, it doesn't really tell us whether local populations are really best and it doesn't tell us this question about how local is local that is how far can you move things before growth or productivity or survival uh, is unacceptable to do that you need long-term field tests uh, that indicate that forest trees are often ad and what we find is that uh, these long-term field tests indicate that forest trees are often adapted to their local climates so this is a new study that we put out uh, I was working working with uh, Connie Harrington from the Olympia lab that we call the D Douglas fir seed source movement trial and here we collected uh, uh, from trees from 60 populations and planted them back into nine planting locations. Uh, this is also called a reciprocal transplant study where you take something uh, from one place and plant it in another place and vice versa. And this, uh, and we're following this for the long term. We have 10 year results uh, to date. Uh, we've planted these in a diversity of environments from up near Mount Rainier, a site called Doorstop, uh, where the uh, mean cold temperature is about 34 degrees to uh, to a uh, warm low elevation site at Stone where the mean cold temperature is warmer about 39 degrees and a site near here called Buckhorn again it's about 39 degrees this is much warmer in in the uh, in the summer than the winter because of cold air drainage but uh, anyways we look at all these variables and we ask the question well which climate variables are driving adaptations our local population is best and uh, how far can we move things before it's a problem and this is some results from this study uh, generally again we conclude that populations are locally adapted that is at all sites sources from climates similar to the test site are among the tallest so for example this is the Norton's test site just uh, west of Corvallis and what we see is that the extreme minimum temperature at that site is about minus 12 degrees and the best the best uh, populations at that site are from around the same extreme minimum temperature if we look at the cold site up at doorstop uh, just north of Mount Rainier it has an extreme minimum temperature of about minus 21 degrees and we find that again the uh, populations from a similar climate are those that are the tallest uh, it may not be exact but it's approximately true in fact what we find sometimes at uh, cold sites is that you can move things a little bit from warmer things and they'll do a little bit better than the local population uh, it's not always true that the local population is best in particular when you go to the far north for example with lodgepole pine in uh, British Columbia then we can find that we can things we we can find populations further north that will do better than the local uh, further south that will do better than the local population but in general populations are locally adapted the other thing to pay attention about this is one there's a lot of variation around there there's, so there's a lot of population variation there's a lot of ver genetic variation within populations we can take advantage of that uh, and then the other thing is well what happens if you move things too far from where it's best adapted and that's what this relationship tells you if you move away to a colder climate uh, you know you may be able to you may be willing to accept a 10 percent reduction in growth well that'll tell you how far you can move it before you reach that 10 percent reduction in growth or to a warmer climate how far you can move it to reach 10 percent reduction in growth this is 10 years old at the time I have a hundred year old study that I just uh, analyzed it's called the Douglas for ready study it was one of the first studies put in by the US Forest Service when the US Forest Service was founded uh, and it tells us some of the same things uh, it tells us one what's really driving adaptation natural selection are cold temperatures to a lesser degree drought uh, but also to some degree but at a larger geographic scale continentality that is if you move things too far from a continental climate to a maritime climate you're going to start to see 
uh, problems with rab decline and needle disease. Uh, that was a surprise to us. We see that in the Douglas fir uh, heredity study and we also see that in the seed source movement trial. It's a bit of a surprise because it has not been a problem. Uh, rab decline has not been a problem with Douglas fir. But all of a sudden, now yeah, we move things far, we're starting to see it. So there's some cautions about moving things too far with respect to continentality. Uh, so, it, uh, so the third point, uh, species show different patterns and degrees of adaptation. So this is a figure uh, from Jerry Rayfeld looking at the distances needed to detect genetic differences in the Northern Rockies. So this is elevational distance differences that is correlated with uh, cold temperatures and frost-free days, also cold temperatures. And what we find is that some species, like Douglas fir and lodgepole pine, you can only move them 200 meters or 20, about 20 days, frost-free days, before you start to uh, see large differences uh, among populations. Other species, like western white pine and western red cedar, can be considered generalists. So you can move them pretty far climatically and therefore also geographically uh, before you start to see differences uh, in genetic variation. That's uh, good news if you're considering using uh, western white pine if it's within the species niche because uh, then you have to worry less about the seed source. <clears throat> the fourth point is that seed zones and seed transfer guidelines have been developed to ensure adaptation and, and uh, Dave already showed a figure of seed zones, you're all very familiar with them. They're basically, we're developed based on the collective knowledge of climate and vegetation types uh, in the early 60s. The important point is they include 500 foot elevation bands. And the reason that's important is, again, trees are adapted to cold temperatures and those 500 foot elevation bands restrict those movements. Uh, they were later revised in Oregon, Washington to account for species specific patterns of variation, so again, Douglas fir has more seed zones with this revision, whereas Western, Western red cedar, a generalist, has fewer seed zones. Uh, I just want to point out there's two types of seed transfer systems. Uh, what I just showed you is what we call a fixed zone system. So basically it says within this seed zone uh, and this elevation band, you can move seed from anywhere there to this, to this planting site. But there's also something called a focal point seed zone, or uh, really it's just seed movement guidelines which have been around since 1939. Uh, and what that says is basically gives you an idea how far you can move things. So you can move things from anywhere in here as long as it doesn't exceed uh, a certain uh, climate in particular, but early on they were just based on elevation and latitude, uh, to this planting site. The seed lot selection tool, which I'm going to talk about, is really the, a focal point uh, seed zone system. So it, it uh, tells you how far, or you tell how far you can move things, and it'll show you where that appropriate place to get those seeds. So uh, again, climates are changing and populations may no, no longer be adapted. So there's three questions. Are native populations adapted to current and future climates? If not, how far do we have to go to find populations adapted to a planting site, essentially uh, assisted migration? How far should we move a population to ensure that it continues to exist? So if a population is threatened and you're concerned about that, for example, maybe Willamette Valley Ponderosa Pine is threatened, how far would you have to go to, uh, to make sure that that population continues, or the genetics in that population continues? At least? Uh, and again, this depends on which climate factors are most important for adaptation. And I've uh, said that it's predominantly cold temperatures, but also uh, aridity or drought, and uh, to a lesser degree that, and, uh, and needle diseases as measured by um, continentality. And then how far climatically can one move populations before growth and survival are unaccepted, unacceptable? Uh, this question about how far you can move things, we don't have a lot of good tests that tell us that. We're starting to get a little bit from this Doug Fur Ready study, but you know, that's not the ideal study. They didn't really understand statistics very well in 1912 when it was established. Uh, one of the things we can do is we can go to the current seed zones, either the 1960-70 ones uh, 
or the newer ones and we can see how much variation there is within those seed zones and we feel pretty comfortable about those seed zones they have worked and so uh, basically if we're pretty comfortable about moving things within that elevation band within that seed zone and we can characterize that climate that gives us a clue about how far we can move things climatically and still be uh, uh, in, in, comfortable with ensuring adaptation and so what we've done is we've done this I've done this with a whole bunch of different seed zones and uh, looking at mean annual temperature for example the average for all the zones in Western Oregon and Washington for Douglas fir uh, and excluding the extremes is about two degrees Celsius and I keep coming up with this number two degrees Celsius for cold mean cold minimum temperatures or mean annual temperature it differs a little bit and interestingly enough I've done this for seed zones in Ontario California uh, and elsewhere and it, it keeps coming up to about that transfer limit and also that's a transfer limit of about what we find for plant hardiness zones so if you're if you're using seed loss selection tool which I'll show you now uh, and you want to ask an idea of what the transfer limits are this will give you an idea so to review there's genetic variation across the landscape there's local adaptation with a range of climates to which populations are adapted species shows different patterns and degrees of adaptation we have seed zones and seed transfer guidelines that help us decide how far we can move things but the climates are changing local populations may no longer be adapted but we can manage genetic variation to respond to those concerns and that's what I want to talk about now uh, again these three questions how far can uh, our, our native populations adapted how far can we move them uh, from uh, to make sure uh, to a planting site or how far can we move them away from uh, as, uh, where we collect them so this is the uh, seed lot selection tool the front page of it and what I'd like to, uh, okay so the seed lot selection tool is a powerful tool what it does is it matches seed lots to planting sites uh, or planting sites to seed lots it uh, it also uh, you can drill into your specific site and it'll characterize the past current and future climates at a site uh, it I think the most valuable thing about the seed lot selection tool is it really does a an, uh, good job of illustrating the potential concerns about climate change uh, the other thing is you can use it uh, not you but agencies or, or other organizations for seed planting given uh, climate change concerns and also those types of organizations can use it to look at gene conservation given climate change concerns so I'll go through some of those yes No, that's a very good question it's just climate so it's based on uh, prism uh, and which and then uh, a it uses climate North America which is this uh, program developed to, to uh, drill down to the specific sites it's a program developed at University of British Columbia by Tong Li Wang and Andreas Haman uh, and all those other factors cold air drainage riparian zones that sort of thing you'll have to consider those yourself it does not consider microclimate so given a planting site which seed lots are well adapted today or in the future or given a seed lot where is it well adapted today or in the future so uh, I'm going to go through an example and uh, the first thing we do is we select the objective the objective we're going to look at is we have a planting site so we're going to find seed lots for that planting site I'm going to look at a planting site that is uh, at the lower elevations of capital forest perhaps a place that uh, you're familiar with uh, you can so uh, the next step is to select a planting site location you can do that by either clicking on the map setting the point 
or you can enter the latitude longitude it'll also show you the elevation of that planting site uh, so this is uh, about 700 and I forget if this which one I did 700 feet uh, and then the next step is to select a region just use automatic what this does is if you're really interested in a large scale this is we, we had to break up the whole continent into regions for reasons of computational uh, problems associated with too big of a region uh, the region is basically Western North America from mid British Columbia to just past the Mexican border so it's a large region but if you were to uh, choose a different region not automatic you could actually map the climate of uh, Washington for example in the eastern United States uh, the next step is to select two climate scenarios so the first one you select is what is the climate that the seed lots the seed sources are adapted to again that's a past climate we generally use 1961 to 1990 uh, the second part is what's the climate of the planting site uh, and, or uh, either what's the climate what, basically what's the date that you're looking at for the planting site you could look at the past to see what how things were adapted before climate change you can look at the recent past or the uh, I want I when we first developed we called it current but it's really no longer current it's uh, the uh, 1981 to 2010 or you can look at three futures the same three futures I talked about before and we'll look at that uh, and then you can use transfer limit method you can use custom which is you just enter what climate variables you think are important and what transfer limits you think are important or you can use what we we developed the zone method so if you use the zone method it tells you what seed zone you're in uh, so and then so this site's in seed zone 240 500 to a thousand foot elevation uh, tells you that right down here uh, when you do that there it depends on the prior inputs into the system so it has the Oregon and Washington have the generic seed zones but it also has those species specific seed zones that were developed a little later on uh, and most most of you and most of the people that I know have generally keep using those older seed zones and that's fine they're a little more conservative than the species specific zones. Uh, and then it also shows you so it shows you the zone and the elevation band then you can look at that and add climate variables that you think are important and adjust the transfer limits so this shows you the values at the planting site so it says the winter minimum temperature is about three degrees Celsius uh, and the annual precip is about 15 uh, 1500 millimeters uh, precip and then it will tell it will enter those transfer limits automatically it'll tell you how much variation there is within this elevation band in this seed zone and what it tells you is there's about 0.7 degrees Celsius and only seven millimeters precip variation in there well that's pretty darn conservative and if you looked at those averages over all of them they're much larger so I'm going to change those values uh, and I'm going to adjust them to plus or minus two degrees Celsius 1.5 two degrees that's probably good uh, and an annual precip Again, things are not as tightly adapted to precip as they are to, to cold temperatures. So I'm going to use something pretty large. Uh, and so I'm going to use 400 millimeters. You can, again, you can play around with these and see how it changes. It doesn't change it a lot. So we'll, uh, next we run the tool. And this is what you get. So uh, basically the dark color is those that are the best match to that seed. Uh, the climate is the best match to that location. So those are where you can go find seed lots that are uh, adapted to that location, assuming local adapt adaptation. Uh, and then as you go further away and it gets lighter, then it's less, well, uh, the match is less. If you play with the climate variables, make them larger or smaller, it just means that the colors will expand out a little bit more. Uh, so this is the results ignoring climate change. And here, the seed zone was about right here. So that's about the elevation band within that seed zone but you also see that that climate occurs outside of that seed zone so the reality is our, our seed zones are pretty conservative and we could probably go to adjacent seed zones as long as we go to a similar elevation band uh, and find material that's 
just as adapted. Uh, then we look at the recent climate, so the last 30 year period. What we found for that site, the temperatures warmed about 0.9 degrees Celsius. Uh, and mean annual precip, as uh, Jessica suggested, doesn't change much. So it's only changed about 10 millimeters. Uh, we map that and we see that the appropriate uh, match, the climate that's similar to that, basically migrates downhill a little bit. So if you want to find seed lots adapted to that site now, it's okay to go downhill a little bit. Uh, by the next uh, few decades, uh, it's warmed about 1.4 degrees Celsius using a uh, RCP of 8.5. We, you know, if we use an RCP of 4.5, uh, it doesn't really show that it's warmed in the next period. Uh, precip hasn't changed. So where does the climate go? Uh, well, it's still adapted. Local populations are still adapted to that planting site. They're still within that climatic range, but uh, better population come from uh, the lower elevations. I think, I think that's probably the Chalice River or something. So lower population. And uh, some places further south, uh, by 2050s, the local population is no longer adapted. It's outside of that range of what we expect things can be adapted to. So we're going we're gonna to start to see problems. We don't see very many problems yet, except for those, year, those uh, successes a year with drought and those sorts of things, we start to see problems. But really, the problems haven't shown up yet. By mid-century, we're going to start to see a lot more problems. It's warmed about two and a half degrees Celsius. Uh, and by 2080, nothing nearby is adapted. Uh, as Jessica pointed out, the, uh, the climate of around here is going to look a lot more like that of Sacramento. And I can illustrate that. So if we zoom out, by 2080s, uh, Sacramento's down here, but the climate here it's going to look a lot more like the climate uh, in this warm pocket in the south coast of Oregon and down around, interestingly enough, the Redwood region. Uh, so it's a good question if Redwood might not be a good species to plant for the future. Not sure it will survive now, but we'll see. So let's just to go, uh, so we've zoomed out just to show you that again by 2020s. That's what the climate uh, match looks like by 2050s further south and by 2080s much further south with nothing nearby that uh, appears to be adapted to that. What this shows us is that the concerns are not too large yet, but if those projections keep going the way that, that they're saying, uh, by the end of the century, it does not look very good. Uh, the other thing you can do is look at planting sites for a seed lot. So we have, we've collected seed from this location. Where will it be adapted to the 2020s? And as you can imagine, those seed lots are appropriate for moving uphill uh, into the uh, Cascades. Uh, and by 2050s, further uphill, and by 2080s, this, this, climate, this climate up here will look like this climate here. Uh, I just want to mention a, a couple other minor points. We have another tool called the Climate Smart Restoration Tool. And this tool, one tool is basically focused on trees. The other tool is more focused on restoration species, uh, driven by a lot by what's going on in, in the Great Basin. Uh, and so we just decided to make two different tools for them. Uh, and this is an example from that tool. And it's looking at Wyoming big sagebrush seed lots. We actually have a uh, option to use a gene ecological model for this tool. This shows you where uh, you make uh, collect sagebrush populations that would be adapted to this planting site in the Snake River Basin. Uh, I mentioned gene conservation. I'm just going to quickly mention this as an example. Uh, where gene conservation, this is an example from a stand of Chihuahuan spruce. There's also beautiful, beautiful Douglas fir right next to this stand. This Chihuahuan spruce is a bit in a microclimate, and so there's some things you need to consider there. But basically, it shows you where the Chihuahuan spruce may be found. It's a, it's a rare species. Uh, what happens to the climate of this native stand? And where could we, if, if it's a concern, where can we find planting sites 
to uh, to plant them so they'll continue to exist. The species continues to exist. And so what we find by 2025, uh, it still looks, the climate looks okay there for it to continue to exist. But by uh, mid-century, the climate disappears in that area. Uh, and particularly by the end of the century. Uh, but the climate then occurs, this shows you the region. Uh, the climate then occurs uh, in California and Oregon uh, now and in the future. So if we want to preserve this species, we might consider taking samples from it and planting them up in Northern California or Southern Oregon. Uh, another example may be Willamette Valley Ponderosa Pine, which was really driving that as a gene conservation for that species. But that was more driven by concerns about urbanization and climate change at the time. But uh, it'd be interesting to look at that. Uh, so conclusions. Climates are warming and are expected to continue wa warm. More so in the north than in the south. If you look at this in Alaska, uh, you know, four to six degrees climate change by mid-century. Uh, in the short term, that is the next decade or so, local populations are still adapted to their local climate. So they're within the range of that tra those transfer guidelines.